Hi there. Welcome to the workshop. Today we're going to be taking a look at my latest Hi-Fi micro layout based upon Wrexham Central, uh, a project that I probably started a couple of months ago and I've spoken about on the blog through uh, through its creation, um, built upon an IKEA Mosslander uh, book display shelf. Probably the smallest uh, micro layout I've built. Um, definitely a cameo. Um, hence the, the idea of a, a hi-fi micro layout, um, something that sort of is perhaps smaller than what people have been building as cameo layouts recently, but, uh, but is, is more than what many consider micro layouts to be. Um, but maybe I'm barking at the wrong tree, but, uh, but that's why I've been describing it as recently. Anyway, you know, it, it's been a real joy over the seasonal break to, um, to work on this and, and to get towards the finish line. I'm really excited now because all through that period I've been able to operate it um, and I'll talk about that in the video shortly. Um, but now it's finished, I can have the light on, turn around and see something that really does transport me, uh, well, not very far up the road, but certainly uh, to whatever point in history at the minute that I can recreate easily with the rolling stock, <laughs> um, but but certainly does put me pla on that platform. I have stood on that platform um, and... The idea of uh, that, the sense of a journey, the sense of waiting for the train to arrive at a terminus and to take you, well, to take you wherever you're going, um, whether that's you know up the line in this case to Bidston or just a few stops or perhaps just a short distance to to interchange somewhere else and, and take you anywhere in the country. Um, there's an energy, isn't there, when we're still waiting for a train? The anticipation so i think uh, i feel like well i hope I've, that's kind of flows through uh through me when i've built this layout I, i've had that energy within me i also think it's interesting to reflect on um on its relative success uh in in the day in the daytime at least for those ad hoc sessions i might be making something on the bench here and then you know you get to one of those moments where you're thinking hmm not quite sure what I need to do next. And then I can just literally spin around, you know, grab the controller uh, and move a train. Um, either, either the train arrives, train departs, or both. Um, and it is quite uh, a calming experience. It's also somewhere, it, um, but that, that process is so tactile and straightforward it doesn't require a lot of thought and therefore some of the things that perhaps we've been thinking about over here or perhaps in your own life, uh, perhaps even away from the layout, it gives uh, our brain a bit of chance to sort of work through some of that. So even though it might only be a couple of minutes away, it feels like a lot more. And I think perhaps, you know, these days a lot of us uh, work from home, obviously me, myself included, um, perhaps not in the same manner that many of you do, but the ability to step away uh, to, from, you know, the laptop, the uh, you know the, the endless calls and things like that and just drive a train could be really really quite useful for you and uh, it's something to uh, to perhaps consider um i know ollie uh, talks about it in my latest book in his uh, in his case study he mentions how his layout became uh, a solace during the pandemic uh, for the endless uh, meetings and things and he could just step up or between meetings and just drive trains so i think the proximity to our life um and the and and to recognise that a model railway isn't all about you know tail chasing or massive switching puzzles and car cards and realistic operation with friends you know sometimes a model railway is somewhere for us to go and uh, and have a quiet moment and you can like more than one type you know you can have a little layout like this in your study or or near your place of work and then you can have a you know a giant you know or be trained if that's what floats your boat uh, up in the loft or in the shed or in the spare room so anyway I probably waffled on far enough especially for something that's literally 55 centimetres long. So I'll pull the camera over and uh, let's go and visit Wrexham Central. So here she is in, uh, in all 55 centimetres of her glory, barely, scenically barely nine centimetres deep, uh, perhaps a touch over, and perhaps more suited to the smaller scales, but... I think with some cre creativity, there's there's no reason why you couldn't do something in a larger scale. Um, if there's a story that you feel sort of fits that intimate space, so you know, I really would look forward to seeing what you uh, you 
can create in the same footprint and by all means do do share that with me here on on the channel in in the comments i'd really appreciate that so as i said in my introduction this model is inspired by wrexham central or uh, wrexham catalog and um the real wrexham central ends unceremoniously now in uh in inverted commas, a modern station within a inner, or sort of inner town centre, well, city centre now, shopping centre. Um, the old station uh, that was sort of around photos I've seen in the 70s was actually a sort of the truncation of the branch that ran, I think, all the way through Ellesmere to Whitchurch um, and then up, up to uh, up to Liverpool through uh, through Bidston. And you know, this stub that was left became the Borderlands. It, it runs today from Wrexham Central up to Bidston. It's a transport for Wales service. I think these days, as of this year, they're seeing 45 minute service. I think recently it's been more like an hour. Uh, and it's seen a variety of, of units over that time as well. So whilst you see a 101 DMU here, you could legitimately get away with some uh, class 150 uh, sprinters. Uh, I think uh, 153 DMUs and uh, and I'm sure a myriad of other things I think even paces at some stage uh, and obviously bang up to date we've got the uh, the 230s the uh, the battery uh, hybrid diesel um, X underground units which I don't think have been quite the success that uh, Transport for Wales were hoping for uh, but they are comfortable and interesting units to go and ride so if you haven't done perhaps uh, perhaps that's uh, an interesting if not slightly curious day out uh, so that's probably all we can say from this view. So let me get the camera a little bit closer. I'm going to move that train out of the way and then talk about some of the detail that sits within the layout and uh, and hopefully intersperse that with uh, a little bit of operation. So with the uh, the locomotive out of the layout, um, we'll just take a quick pan here. There's not much to it. Um, and that means that what we have got needs to be um, neat, well executed. The color palette needs to be muted, nothing too garish. So there's some design decisions straight away when you're building a small layout. You know, you really do need to be practicing ensuring there's no gaps and you've got neat cuts and no unsightly joins in anything. And, you know, the odd one's fine here and there, isn't it? But I think it's something we should all aspire to, and especially in, in N and in a Hi-Fi Micro such as this. So looking at this end of the layout, <clears throat> you'll notice there's a, a faded back scene here and think, you know, where did James get that from? Well, actually, I stood on the bridge here uh, and took a photo um, looking out that way. Uh, and I thought, you know what, that might work as a back scene. It wasn't taken with, with the intention of becoming a back scene, as you can probably tell from the, the angle of the uh, of the back of those retail units on the on the left of the image. But but I think it works all right. I think, uh, you know, the, the shape kind of works. And, you know, what else are you going to put there? It's going to need to be a picture of Wrexham, and that is the view. So what I've done, though, is I've muted that down. So I've desaturated it, and I've made it slightly opaque, uh, in my graphics software before printing it, I tried different uh, different levels of opacity to kind of get the feeling I was after. And obviously it's not opaque when you print it out on paper, but that's an easy way of, uh, of adjusting that. And uh, yeah, the, it gives it gives a sense of distance where otherwise there wouldn't be one, especially in, in such a shallow space. You'll note the, uh, the bridge is very distinctive and it's not 100% accurate. Um, it's inspired by definitely, and I think those of you who know the area will, will recognise it, but uh, but I've tweaked and adjusted it uh, as we do as artists. And, uh, you know, the, the, the detail of the uh, the two the two pillars, but the bridge carrying on um, is is quite different. Obviously, the bridge is bigger than we uh, than we can see here. And the old second track um, through under this particular archway as in recent years had a strengthening structure placed there so that was built up out of styrene and you know in real life that looks like it's probably a sort of red faded to pink but i've used a more orangey color there and this is all about choices and um the palette across the whole layout and i felt that that would match better while still being a nod to the prototype 
there's a, a tiny, tiny limited clearance sign in here as well, and, and 15. And if you note know, the Wrexham Central sign and things like that. And these these little fine touches need to be done in moderation. And uh, But they really place the layout if you get them right. Um, Eagle-eyed amongst you will notice the road sign as well at the, at the bridge. And that's roughly in the right location. Uh, and is a, a capture from Google Street View of the actual road sign. And printed out and glued onto a piece of styrene. So... You know, there's no rocket science in any of this as such. There's just care, thought. Um, I, I won't say really attention to detail, but certainly an attention to the art and keeping in mind what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, so I, I'm really happy with the composition at this end. You know, when the when the locomotive bursts through that tunnel, um, it is like sitting on that platform, standing on that platform, waiting for the train to arrive. You know, seeing the train appear from uh, from that bridge uh, is is. Uh, is is part of that magic of of the anticipation, and let's so let's uh, let's take a look further down the platform. Uh, there's some three D printed details here. The uh, the station sort of what's next board there is perhaps a bit overscale. Uh, I did sort of ponder about whether to include that, but it's there now. I mean, what we've got here is a station that's a bit of a mishmash of details, you know, of, of periods, and that's because I'm not set on one period as such. Um, so, so it doesn't seem relevant to me to make it accurate to one particular era. I'm, I'm more going for a feel, I think. So you've also got that electrical cabinet at the back and a small figure from Model U, Andy York, there waiting for a train. The real challenge in this layout has been this canopy, and that was mainly the reason I built this, uh, this small project based on Wrexham, because it's a modern canopy. Um, it's a sort of fairly modular construction, actually, to be fair, even the Victorians built modular sort of constructions with canopies. But it's uh, it's probably of it of this is very much of its time. Um, I would have said sort of 2000s, late 90s. I don't know without looking up on Wikipedia when the station was changed. And it uses some custom etched parts that I designed. So all those wings that support the canopy are etched brass. They are spaced along a series of brass rods. Um, of various diameters that rep represent, you know, the the sort of structure of the uh, the canopy, and that's been soldered together. And then at the centre of it is a styrene rod that runs square rod that runs all the way down, and that's what the uh, support poles are just glued to. Um, you know, I'd probably do it differently if I did it again, but I learned quite a lot from doing the process, and the result is is remarkably fine. And certainly has all the character of the prototype, even without being able to go and take out accurate dimensions, or at least without looking like a total lunatic. So this was scaled from photos and, and sort of other inverted commas known dimensions. And I think it does the job. I think it certainly feels like Wrexham. And that dark shadow that it creates under the platform is exactly how it's like when you're there. Um, you know, it feels like if you stand in those shadows, you know, you're not sure what's going to happen to you. It doesn't feel safe in this part of the station. It's really strange. You know, you feel safe out in the open at the end. But in that piece running up there, you know, even during the daytime, there's a little bit of jeopardy during the day because it's in shadow. Of course, at night, it doesn't feel like that because it's all lit up. It feels, you know, much safer and lighter. Um, those tiny little benches in there, they're etched brass from N brass and Oh my goodness, they are possibly the fiddliest brass construction I've ever done, folding up the tiny little tabs on them. But I think they were, it was worth it. They're a lot finer than anything in 3D printing. You'll notice uh, also that the um, the Rowie buffers and hydraulic buffer uh, stands aren't, you know, if you look at photos, they're not 100% accurate. But people who've seen it think, gosh, that looks really neat. Um you know, I've gone for an inspiration. I've shortened it all slightly. You know, it's Wrexham Central, but it's not 100% to scale. I'd say it's sort of like an 80% representation of, uh, of Wrexham. And in this particular composition, I've been really helped by the fact that the Superstore is the ba the backdrop along this section. And so, you know, that's just sections of styrene, scribed, painted um, and, uh, and weathered. And I think it works really well in this context here. And I'm really pleased with that. And just looking down uh, at this end of the layout, we can see another photo back scene. Again, a photo taken from the bridge when I visited. There's perhaps, if I'm being really critical, perhaps too much of a blue tint to this. Perhaps the haze of the day, I should have perhaps added a bit of warmth to uh, to the printout. Uh, but I had to have the cathedral in the background, you know. It, it instantly places it, um, instantly places the layout. So the station buildings on the back scene itself, you can see the windows have been recently smashed at the bottom and been played, uh, boarded up with plywood. And the um, 
the canopy is 3D and I think that that sort of subterfuge works well down here and uh, and certainly uh, the entrance to the station in real life which is uh, down here on this corner you come in there's another warehouse along here uh, or shop I should say and you walk in through this little gap and then down here and along the platform uh, I feel like uh, I feel like it it captures some of that uh, that that journey through there and although uh, again there's probably details I've missed out um, usually on purpose but but um, there's enough there that, that says this is Wrexham I was keen with this project not to betray Wrexham in some kind of strange fairy tale. You know, it's it's a city uh, not without its problems. Um, you know, there's there's an, I I would say probably without checking a, an above average level of unemployment. Um, you know, some of the the heavy industry in this area hasn't really been replaced with uh, with any sort of meaningful work for for the majority of people, and you know that that does start to take. An impact or have an impact on the town centre, city centre, its environs, um, and obviously places like the station, things like that that are at the edges of of that space, um, you know, suffer to some degree with with that as well. And whilst you know there's there's no graffiti and that should be commended, um, there are there are when I visited, I've visited a couple of times and both times there's been evidence of rough sleeping on the platform. And I think you know when you stand there and you feel how cold that platform is even in the spring or the summer and you think gosh there's absolutely you know what way on hell's earth i'd want to be here overnight you know those poor people you know there's a lot of people who perhaps might have some um rather unkind things to say about people who uh, are in that position and perhaps you know perhaps they could help themselves and there might be some argument in that but you know just the the grim reality of that existence i i didn't want to sort of glamorize that but i also didn't want to ignore it and uh and i hope i've kind of included that experience in here without uh without drama but but certainly not uh not glossed over and you'll see there on the platform in the center of this view are uh, some cardboard boxes uh these were just knocked up out of some brown paper i had and uh, and probably aren't entirely accurate in terms of box construction but i think have the right sort of feel Another element, and sadly, of our modern railway is uh, is litter, um, and that's something you can't really ignore if you're modelling any sort of period from the sort of seventies onwards, really. And whilst I haven't done coke cans and plastic bags and all the rest of it, you know, I, I think in in certainly an end that would appear too visually cluttered. Uh, I've just gone for small fragments of well, in nondescript paper. So we're not quite sure what this paper is. Is it a newspaper? Is it, you know, flyers that have been disposed of? Is it a mixture? Is that actually a crisp packet? We just can't see that it's actually coloured. You know, who knows? There's enough of it and it's got the right shape that it kind of tricks us into thinking, yeah, there's a litter knocking around. So again, um, thin paper. I think I use the sort of slightly waxy paper that you get in um, packaging sometimes. And that is um, cut up in various small sizes and creased between my fingers and then glued in place with a drop of scenic cement and it that secures it without you know totally ruining it the waxed paper um would if i hadn't used the wax paper obviously only glued it it would adjust and change how the the um you know the fibers within the paper would look so uh, so that's that that's that reason and i think in this view that this static scene that you're seeing here you know those those odd scraps of paper up against the edge of the platform up against the rails up against the you know the hydraulic rams there the they feel right to me. They, even though they are literally tiny, um, they feel right to me. They feel in scale. Uh, and so that, that's been a, another success and to some degree an experiment. It's something I've done in larger scales. I haven't tried it then. Taking another close-up view of this end, and I just wanted to mention really how some of these details were made because I quite often get asked. And although uh, as a modeler, I'm much more about why, uh, I do appreciate that there's plenty of you out there who really like that why, but also want to try and emulate it uh, for their own projects. So an element of how can be useful. So to uh, to touch on that road sign on the bridge and the number 15 and the little um, limited clearance sign, they were all taken from photos uh, apart from the uh, the 15, uh, which I actually 
took from a photo and then drew up because it wasn't quite sharp enough uh, in on the computer. Um, they were printed out on paper, um, nothing special, just, you know, paper that I got from the bargain store um, and glued to the thinnest styrene I have here, which I think is 10 thou. So glued to 10 thou styrene with super glue, which sounds mad, but the super glue soaks into the paper. And as a result, it means that the print on the paper doesn't, um, you know, doesn't dissolve with water over time. It also means the paper is really well stuck. So once that's stuck down, you can then trim them out with a pair of nail scissors or a sharp knife and then clean them up and touching the edges with some paint. I think the results speak for themselves. Uh, however, the Wrexham Central sign was done slightly differently on the platform. Uh, that was actually, uh, again, it's very thin styrene, but I would probably suggest it may be 15 thou, 20 thou this time. Um, and it is a decal. So I designed the, uh, the the text, if you like, on the computer. And rather than print it out on paper, I had my uh, decal supplier print it out on a clear background. And that was applied over some white styrene, which I had added some rust to before I put the decal on. So the, the rust appears behind the decal. It works really well uh, in this instance and it looks sharp enough. I think I'm really pleased with that. The, uh, the lamppost is a section of uh, brass rod with some styrene for the lamp and the piece at the bottom, I believe, is probably hypodermic needle, but you know, don't hold me to it. And you can also see the, uh, the TPS grids there in the track. They were 3D prints from, I think, my still wagon works. Uh, so there you go, uh, some, some how-to at this end of the layout. So at this end of the layout, you can see we've got uh, my usual 12 volt power supply in, that's from the, uh, for the laptop battery supply, uh, sorry, laptop power supply. And we've got a DIN and plug, uh, which is for my gauge master aging now, gauge master model W, probably best part of nearly 30 years old. Um, and that's running rather than off a 16 volt AC supply, it runs off this 12 volt DC. So this feeds both the lights, but also the power supply for the controller. And obviously the controller then runs the track. Um, and what you've got here is it in its stowed form, it literally just sits on the shelf. Uh, but if we want to run a train, actually you can see here to pull this fiddle stick out, there's actually a little uh, bar that sits on the end that also stops the train uh, running off. So we pull this out and tucked down the back here is the, oh, is the track. Make sure I don't drop anything. And so literally this is just a, a stick of 6mm MDF with the same track as on the layout and it's connected via fish plates that are on the ends of the rails that are protected by uh, the fiddle stick when it's pushed in so nothing gets damaged. So I just sort of make sure I can pull this out far enough. Now, if I was doing this again, I might use a slightly uh, stiffer material for my fiddle stick support. I just used what I had lying around. It was a bit of a proof of concept at the time. Um, and so uh, it it does bend a little bit with the, uh, with the weight of the unit on it. Uh, and that's it. So we now got power onto the fiddle stick through here. And, uh, and the train can't run off the end because the, the little bar is still there. And it means we can shuffle a train. A train can go somewhere now. As you can see, uh, we've got space here for the 101. And actually, if you notice, there's a little bit of space here. The actual length of this was sized for the Farish 150. So... Uh, a little bit of flexibility and if you know if operation was really your thing you could perhaps consider to do the same idea of fiddlestick but with um, small cassettes using aluminium channel perhaps bulldog clips here uh, to transfer the power over and then you could switch between eras just by sort of lifting the cassette off you could put another cassette on and switch to the dmu from uh, from the sprinter and vice versa uh, who knows what what's to come from farish at the moment we have a number of arriva trains wales liveries on that 150 um, if they do a transport for Wales, that would also be uh, up to the minute and applicable. I have travelled behind and seen those units on the line. So it's quite exciting. Um, at the moment, my favourite is this uh, this second hand and rather tired 101 that I have uh, have brought up to scratch with. Uh, I added the missing details and tidied up the paintwork and things. And, 
you know, she runs really nicely and reminds me of, you know, my youth really. Um, so, you know, I, I think a nod to childhood nostalgia is okay from time to time. So hopefully that was of interest and, uh, and I've whet your appetite for the potential that modelling in small spaces offers um, either in your workplace, uh, be that your study or whatever, or, or just elsewhere in your home. A layout like this, when it's when you've seen it stashed away, you know, it literally just takes up the space uh, of one of those sort of Mosslander shelves. It doesn't, you know, there's no increase in footprint. Um, and I'd go as far as to say that uh, a well-executed one probably adds something to the home. It's like a 3D creation. Um, I think it gives us a chance to be artful, to think about what we're trying to uh, communicate to, to those that, uh, that look at it and enjoy it. And so actually, you know, people outside of the hobby can, can see, perhaps understand a bit more about, you know, yourself, because I think there's a little bit of us in, in what we create. Um, and the stories that, that come from there. So, you know, find your own story. Don't be afraid of, you know, expressing that in miniature. Um, and, and you know, a, a layout project doesn't have to be something that's a lifetime. You know, these sorts of things can be something that you sort of rattle off in a couple of months. It can be incredibly rewarding. And uh, I, I've really enjoyed this one and I'm looking forward to what comes next. So, as always, thanks for watching. And uh, if you... Um, if you've enjoyed it, perhaps you know, mention my channel to your friends. I'd really appreciate it. But for now, uh, until next time, I'll see you again soon.